Uh, I'm Charlie, part of um, Divest London, a campaign looking to get institutions across uh, the capital to divest from fossil fuels. I will be your host for this morning's session. And my name is David. I'm part of Divest London as well and Fossil Free UCL, which is a campus-led grassroots group that's trying to get the university right down the street to divest its £21 million pound pension fund from uh, fossil fuels. Uh, welcome to the event. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, this is really exciting because we are here to fight the most powerful industry of all time. <laughs> Boo! Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give a quick outline of the day, um, just so everyone's on the same page. Um, so this session, the opening session, is going to last just over an hour. It's a kind of one-stop shop for all things divestment. We're going to run over the history of the campaign, arguments, key successes, and a Q&A at the end. We're then going to break for lunch, um, which will last an hour from 12.45, and then... All right, and there are three workshops uh, sessions, and I'm sure you all saw in the lobby when you got here what they all are, and they're going to be <coughs> three sessions, 45 minutes each, 15 minutes in between each session, and you have four choices. If you don't know which one to do, I recommend staying in this big room right here, because that seems to be where the most popular ones are happening. So that's going to be from 1.45 to 4.45. And at 4.45, we're going to return to the main hall for concluding sessions. And at 5.15, we're going to go to the pub. Woohoo! Woo All right. Cool. Um, so what do we want to have done by the time we get to the pub? In other words, why are we here? Um, so I wanted to just run over three key aims for the day, just so everyone's got those in front of mind. Um, the first of those is uh, to learn new skills and new knowledge, um, whether it's learning more about um, investments or getting your campaign in, in the media. Uh, whatever your skill level, there's something here for everyone, so take advantage of that. <clears throat> the second is to meet new people. Um, we've gathered here today loads of people who care deeply about this issue and want to take action so take advantage of that meet new people build those links uh, moving forward finally we want to get people active um, we're all here um, not only because we're interested but also because we want to actually do something uh, we want to empower people today to go out and take on the status quo and move the needle on climate change everyone needs to leave here if you're not already a divestment campaigner yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, well now we're gonna get everybody up and talking and chatting. <coughs> and I want everyone to stand up <coughs> and look around and find someone you haven't met or you don't already know. And I want you to go introduce yourself to that person Wait, and hold say, up, hold, up. hold on, one sec. <laughs> say the most profound thing you've ever done in the name of climate change. So Charlie covered himself in oil one time and I recycled a bottle. This morning, yeah. which is pretty good. Big, big or small? Yeah, anything. In the name of... Who are, who are, I, don't know, I don't know you guys really. Hi. Hi. Holly, Siobhan, I'm Dan, that's me. Hi. What's the most extreme thing? Most outlandish thing I've done in the United States. It's not that much, really, actually. No, it's not. It's not that much, really. 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 Train dodge? Oh, cool, nice. That's brilliant. Yeah. Do you organize well around public transport? I used to. Yeah. I'm not so much now, but Yeah, I think it's a real important arena of struggle, but we're going to ignore it a lot. It's like, you know, there's real potential for, like, trying to get this. Oh, hi, Wolfgang. Nice to meet you. You can just take a contact there or you can come and sit. Organised the National Day in February. It was so long ago, to the tune of Let It Go. Oh, yeah. Classic. Let It Go. Yeah. We sung it in the centre of the shopping area of Bristol. Let's do this. Let's do this. Oh wow. No, we didn't do it. That's so organized. Well, we did a few actions. I think that was it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of organization that, that requires as well. So it's, it's like, it's people inspiring. Wow, these kind of companies really know how to sort themselves out. Yeah. <laughs> they can really move. Yeah. Yeah, no, we were, we were uh, actually planning an occupation at our university because we expect them to say no yeah. on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, in fact, they, they, they ruined it. We're planning to take a space in the Roos building where they hold a lot of conferences. It's like a building on campus. That's where we've got to for them. It's really like fun to uh, do conference projects. Okay, thanks everyone. Can we bring it back together? T feel free to take a seat once more and we're, we're going to get it going on the session. But we were, we just didn't expect Thank it at all. We really weren't planning at all. Hey, so So just um, quickly a couple of housekeeping things and then we'll get going. Um, first is the fire procedures. Um, if the fire alarm goes, it's not a test. So that will mean there is a fire and you should leave via the uh, exit doors there. Fire marshals will guide you. Um, another thing is social media. If you're on Twitter, hashtag obviously keep it in the ground. Get the conversation going if you're that way inclined. Um, and finally, my most, probably my favorite part of the day is the sticker system we have here. Um, so anyone with a gold sticker means they're already in a campaign, so please go up to them, talk to them about that, uh, and get some conversations going. Cool. Great. All right. Well, we are going to have a few speakers now. And the first person that's going to talk is Danny Pappard from 350.org. She is a long-standing activist and campaigner who's been involved in oil spills with Liberate Tate, mass anti-fracking camps where they claim the power, and a week-long occupation of a power station chimney. My personal favorite Pretty thing. Badass. She's a total badass and one of my favorite people in London. And she is going to talk to you about the fossil fuel divestment campaign in the UK. All right, let's give it up for Danny Pappard. Hi. Um, so before I start, I'd like to say a few thank yous. Um, firstly, uh, to the Quakers for letting us use this really beautiful venue um, for free, because they are really into divestment. And thank you, the Quakers, particularly Alison, who's been really amazing, and the whole team. Uh, also, The Guardian, and particularly Emma Howard for um, inviting many of you here today. Uh, all of the speakers, the stall holders, the lunch giver outers, the fire stewards, like everyone that's um, pulled together to make this happen. This is a really grassroots effort. Um, and finally, all of you for, um, for showing up and uh, being here on this Saturday, giving your time and your energy and your open-mindedness to being part of this um, really exciting movement. So thank you. Um, and I've not brought the clicker with me, so I'll just... Uh... <laughs> So what started with a group of students in Swarthmore University in the US um, has now grown to be the fastest growing divestment campaign the world has ever seen. The divestment movement spread really quickly from university campuses in the States to faith institutions, local governments, health institutions, philanthropic foundations, pension funds around the world. And there are now over 1,100 uh, local campaigns on petition sites um, on this map and many, many more efforts kind of above and beyond that. Um, and we're making some serious ground. In September 2014, on the eve of the 400,000 strong climate march through New York, with 2,645 other events all around the world at the same time, it was announced that 181 institutions and 637 individuals with an asset base of $50 billion had committed to divest. Um, for those of you that saw the announcement, you would have noticed that one of those commitments was none other than the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the forefathers of the fossil fuel industry <coughs> itself, turning its back on the industry that it has tried to change and it had failed. The significance of this move was lost on very few. Um, since then... We've increased the number of commitments to 245 institutions and the value is still being calculated. Um, in this time, Syracuse University with a $1.8 billion fund, followed days later by the Guardian Media Group with $800 million, were the single biggest divestment commitments to date. They got dwarfed weeks later by the Norwegian Pension Fund 
one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world, in a single move, took $5 billion out of coal. Um, so things are, things are really moving. Um, the movement has won the endorsement of the UN. Really important figures like this guy, uh, Desmond Tutu, um, uh, who says it makes no sense to invest in an industry that undermines our future. Couldn't agree with him more. Um, it's forcing ripples in the financial circles and making allies in unexpected places. Here in the UK, the movement is going from strength to strength. Across Europe, we've had many of the firsts. Health campaigners from Fossil Free Health have pushed the British Medical Association, the trade body for all of our doctors, to commit to divest. Divest Invest Europe have just announced 100 charitable foundations divested just the other week. We've had the first universities, the first faith, domination, faith denominations, and the first major national media outlet coming on board. Um, and I'll let these um, inspiring campaigners on the panel talk, talk more about that. Um, so why do I think the divestment movement has been so successful? Um, my theory is this. Number one, divestment speaks to the power dynamics of the situation we are in. For anyone of you that hasn't read the seminal Rolling Stone article, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, or seen the film, Do the Math, about the genesis of this movement, then I strongly encourage you to do that. Using the basic maths of climate change, which we know we can't go over two degrees, we have a carbon budget of 565, and the fossil fuel industry has five times more than that already. Those are the basic maths that these pieces lay out the fossil fuel industry really as public enemy number one that is standing in the way of the change that we need. Um, the divestment movement is not about recycling our bottle tops as much as individual action is really important. The divestment movement is about challenging the very power structures that have seen hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars every year spent lobbying politicians, propagating misinformation about climate change and searching for even more fossil fuels. Number two, divestment is a simple concept that most people that understand the threat of climate change get intuitively. If you don't like it, don't support it. If it's wrong to wreck the planet, then it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. Thirdly, the divestment movement is decentralised and it's grassroots. The over a thousand campaigns around the world started by people in their own homes, in their own workplaces, in their own <coughs> universities, and thousand more interactions on top of that make this movement uncontainable. Anybody can pick up the narrative and run with it, and we are. There are no real leaders of this movement we can't know everyone that acts under the divestment banner, but wherever and whoever you are, we are united by a common message and a common tactic, and that makes us powerful. Everyone can take part, and you cannot cut off our many heads. Um, number four, um, our divestment case is backed by some really powerful financial arguments. While the moral case is irresistible to many of us, the growing body of work on the financial risk of fossil fuel investments and warnings for stranded assets I mean, the divestment message is reaching audiences in different ways and strengthening our case. Fifthly, divestment is building momentum and creating wins. Divestment alone will never create the change that we need, and we know that. But what the divestment movement is doing, which this movement desperately needs, is giving hope. It gives us a chance to build our power and moments along the way when we can see that we are winning and can celebrate together. I was with the Warwick students this week when their good news came in, and it was very hard not to cry along with them at the great joy of what they'd achieved. Um, and finally, from South African apartheid to Darfur to tobacco, we know from past successes that divestment can win. On Nelson Mandela's first visit abroad after being released from prison, um, one of the first was to the US to meet the students of Berkeley to thank them for the divestment movement for the role they'd played in breaking the back of South African apartheid. While big tobacco, for example, is still incredibly profitable, following the divestment campaign in the 90s, it is no longer politically possible for the big tobacco to sit on the decision-making table on issues around public health and smoking, or to put out misinformation about the dangers of smoking. Similar to the fossil fuel industry, the now infamous internal memo from the tobacco company Brown & Williamson proclaimed Doubt is our product, since it is, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. Ouch. <laughs> uh, 
So I think the divestment movement is one of the really exciting things that's happening at the moment, and it's a real honour um, to be with you here today. Um, we will never financially bankrupt the fossil fuel industry, um, but that's not what this is about. I hope we can do what successful divestment movements have done in the past and politically and socially bankrupt uh, the industry. We need to make them the public enemy number one that they are and stop them physically obstructing the progress we need on climate change. When the fossil fuel industry no longer sits on the negotiating table for climate talks with its business plan clogging up the airways, when, there is no, when it is no longer politically acceptable for our institutions of standing, be that universities, be that art institutions, to take dirty fossil fuel money and display their corrupted logo, when it would be inconceivable to give public money to support the fossil fuel industry, that is when our work is done. I could not care less if some faceless suit buys the shares that the Church of England, Edinburgh University or the British Medical Association have dropped. What I do care about is that our faith organisations, our health organisations and our institutions of higher learning are drawing a line in the sand, turning their back on the fossil fuel industry and changing the way our society and politicians think about the fossil fuel industry and their transition from the benign energy providers to the pariah industry they are, putting their profits ahead of global action for all of us. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming to this event. Um, you won't, today there won't be any sessions about climate science um, because we know it and that's why we're here. Uh, the sessions today will really focus on building our power and learning new skills and meeting new people um, so uh, we can keep on building this amazing movement and so um, thank you for everything that you already do and everything that you will continue to do. Really amazing stuff. Thanks so much, Danny. Really situating the context of why we're here, giving you a little tingle. A little tingle, I felt that. <laughs> so next, um, we're really lucky to have Luke Sussens. He's um, been the senior researcher at Carbon Tracker for three years, written reports on stranded assets on the fossil fuel industry in China, Australia. Um, his background is in climate science and policy. And um, quick plug, you can find him on Twitter... Um, at sus underscore quach, Q-U-A-T-H. So um, I'd like to welcome Luke. Uh, hello. Um, I'm from the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Uh, and hopefully you've heard of us before, um, from the concepts of unburnable carbon and the carbon bubble. And today I'm going to run through a few of the sort of financial arguments that I think people can make which really point out the, um, the weaknesses in a number of fossil fuel companies' business models and the industry as a whole uh, and generally point out some of the risks. It's kind of like a tour de force of my favourite graphs, um, which surely everyone has favourite graphs. I, mean, I have loads. Um, anyway, so this is... This is the uh, concept of unburnable carbon. I thought I'd go over it um, for those who aren't entirely familiar with it. Um, and as Danny said, it's, it's about taking a carbon budget, so the amount of CO2 that we can emit to 2050, which more recently in 2013 with the London School of Economics, we estimated was around 900 gigatons of CO2. Um, and we just compare that against the carbon embedded in global coal, oil and gas reserves. Um, and that totaled 2,860 gigatons of CO2. So we concluded that two-thirds of these fossil fuel reserves are unburnable. And if you can't burn them, then potentially there is a valuation impact. Maybe they're not worth as much as these companies actually think, and that actually that's actually a really, really significant risk. Um, there's a couple of other things which I think are really important to note in this sort of discussion, and that's that we only compare it against fossil fuel reserves in this diagram. But actually, there are things called fossil fuel resources beyond those fossil fuel reserves. Now, these are these fossil fuel assets that are less certain, that the companies are less certain that they're going to be able to get out of the ground and sell to the market. They're slightly more speculative assets, kind of like the Arctic, for example. Now, these resources are far, far, far larger than this 2,860 gigatons of CO2. Companies are spending billions upon billions every single year 
we actually calculated that the top 200 companies spend $674 billion every year to try and prove these resources into reserves. Now, this is kind of a risky approach to um, using shareholders' capital, as we see it. Um, it's also worth noting that this carbon budget only actually gives you an 80% certainty that you're going to hit the two degrees limit of climate change. Now, if somebody offered me an option of whether or not I get on a plane and there's a 20% chance that it won't, might not make its destination, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't get on. Um, but there are even carbon budgets that people emphasize that it's a 50-50 chance. Uh, a carbon tracker, we really kind of ignore those carbon budgets because I think it's probably a tiny bit irresponsible to put the fate of the planet on a coin, uh, a coin toss, essentially. Um, but this carbon budget doesn't guarantee that we hit two degrees scenario. That's just a sense of how urgent um, the situation is. And as Danny summarized so well, there's been really great momentum building behind a number of big investors and asset owners selling out of fossil fuels. As she mentioned, the Norwegian oil fund um, selling out of coal. AXA, one of the world's biggest insurance companies, not only selling out of coal, but then actually taking the next step and actually committing a great deal of money towards low carbon tech and the green sector. Um, divesting is one thing, then actually what you do with the, the capital is actually the next step, and so that was rather impressive. And then other um, asset owners, such as store brands and insurance companies that are all based in Scandinavia. Scandinavia is actually quite progressive on this issue. Um, anyway, to get to the fun stuff. Um, so the financial arguments, uh, if we start with coal, coal is kind of the low-hanging fruit here. We're seeing a lot of investors sell out of coal just simply because it makes such financial sense. So this graph up here on the top left, we have two uh, lines going upwards. One is just an index of world securities, just general traded companies. The other is an index of world energy companies, again, going up. The one which is absolutely tanking is coal companies. This is a coal index. You can see that over the last five years, that's gone down over 50%. Um, and the coal companies are kind of seeing their writing on the wall, and they're fighting for their lives. Um, we did a, a report on U.S. coal companies in particular. Some of them have lost over 80% of share value just in the last three years. They're pretty much worthless, those shares now. And one of those companies is this Peabody Energy, which is the poster here. Uh, and they're the largest coal company in the U.S. And... This is their new approach and of the whole coal industry as a whole, actually, and it's rather cynical uh, in that it says, well, coal is necessary for the future because there's 1.3 billion people around the world that are actually in energy poverty. And if we want to get them energy, then coal is the easiest, the cheapest, and the best way to do that. And at Carbon Tracker, we've been called a number of things in our time, uh, and at the moment, it's that we just hate the poor, essentially, um, which is good. Um, so... <laughs> This is their poster which says, uh, our children turn to us for a brighter energy future, which I think is particularly uh, ludicrous. Um, and if you're really into this sort of stuff, you can look on our website where we wrote a report on this that actually shows that renewable energy, off-grid um, renewables, sort of solar lanterns and micro-grids renewable solutions are actually far, far cheaper than coal for providing energy to these energy poor because... Coal is really expensive when you build a giant power plant, giant transmission lines, and generally all in, it's, it's not, nowhere near as cheap as they say. So anyway, this is the financial argument for coal. It's a pretty easy one, but that's why we're seeing so many investors move on it. If we go to oil, oil is a bit more difficult. People aren't selling out of oil quite as much. Um, but there are definitely weaknesses in the interest. I mean, the reason why people aren't selling out of it is because it's not as easily substitutable. I mean transport, oil in transport, quite difficult to phase out. But there are arguments for it. And this is a really good graph. Um, so the red line is how much money the global oil majors are spending to try and find more fossil fuels and get it out of the ground. Pretty steep curve. And you'd think that production would be following that curve. If you're an investor and you're saying, look, I'm getting good value for my money, you want to see oil for that. You want to get some bang for your buck. Now, the grey line is production, and you see that it starts going down. And this essentially means that these oil companies are having to spend more and more money to try and get the same amount of oil out of the ground. This is why they're going to such far-off, dangerous, technically complex places like the Arctic, like deep water in Brazil. It's because they haven't got any other option. They have to go to these places. But this doesn't demonstrate shareholder value. You can tell investors this. You can say, ask your oil company that you have holdings in, how do you justify this? You're, you're selling a finite product and it's becoming clear. Um, 
And so then there's a bit more on this. And so you're putting money into these assets that are quite risky and really expensive to get out the ground. And you can see this graph on the top left, which we produce at Carbon Tracker, is, uh, is sort of localizing where that money's going. And that one giant bar, which actually represents about $400 billion, is the tar sands in, in Canada, in Alberta. That stuff is the most expensive, the most financially ludicrous oil on the planet. Um, not only the actual literal scarring of the, of the world, um, but you can see how expensive it is. It's just not a good investment. And it requires a really, really high oil price to make any money for these guys. Now, this graph on the bottom right shows what happened to the oil price at the end of last year when it halved in value in just three months. Most of these companies probably didn't think that was going to happen. And I'm pretty sure they didn't build that into their project decision-making, you know. They're not sort of going to the Arctic saying, oh, we'll still make money if it's $60 a barrel, because mm, you're going to make a huge loss on it. So these are the sorts of risks that we're also trying to talk to investors, and we encourage other people to talk to them about as well. Um, and then, beautifully, at the same time, there are uh, disruption factors for these industries. And the major one of that is renewable energy. And the cost of renewable energy is coming down the entire time as the cost for a number of these companies is going up. There will be an inflection point where these two curves cross and renewable, renewable energy becomes cheaper. But this one here, the Terradome graph, which uh, is from a Wall Street bank, really know their stuff, good analysis. This is, um, has fossil fuel industry, so coal, oil, and gas, sort of pootling along at the bottom in terms of price. And then that giant black protruding line that seems to be ruining the party is, um, is solar energy. And that's how quickly the costs have come down in just that sort of five, five year period of time. And this, this Wall Street bank, call it the terror dome for these companies. This fundamentally threatens their business model. They're not really planning for that. And they're not really transitioning to it either. Um, so that's kind of cool. And these two graphs down here are, again, just looking out into the future. These are looking out to 2030. There's only one direction of travel here. These renewable energies are becoming cheaper and cheaper. The writing is on the wall. These companies are fighting for their lives. We just have to be sophisticated about the way that we talk to them. Um, so finally, what are they saying? Um, so we talk to them quite a lot. And, well, actually only the ones that like us. A lot of them don't really like being told that their business model doesn't work. Um, so some of them talk to us, some of them don't. Um, so they say that the carbon bubble, i.e. the potential overvaluation of these assets, is overly simplistic. Well, to be honest, that might be true. But then ExxonMobil say that two degrees, never going to happen. They've just thrown the climate under the bus. They're, they're happy to do that. It's kind of ludicrous. Um, you get people like Shell kind of saying, yeah, we get the science. We know it's un there is unburnable amounts of carbon out there. Um, but they come up with sort of these solutions such as carbon capture storage, which is really hasn't gone anywhere, and kind of come up with these sort of excuses. It's kind of the same for BP. They kind of agree with the science. They say there is a lot of unburnable carbon out there, but what are you going to do? Um, so I thought I'd leave with this quote because I kind of find myself weekly sort of thinking, I wonder where we are on that spectrum. And this is, this is Gandhi saying, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Um, each week, I seem to think that we're at a different stage of those four. Uh, some of them are definitely ignoring us. Some of them kind of are laughing at us. A lot of them are really, really fighting for their lives, as I say. So maybe we're in this stage three. I don't know. Maybe we're close to the win. I don't know. But uh, it's a good way to frame it, I think. It's a good way to frame the discussion. Um, and so that's me. Thanks. All right, let's get a big hell yeah for renewables. Woohoo! All right, guys. Everybody, let's get up again and let's get moving and let's do a chant. We good for that? <laughs> That's right. All right, Charlie. Keep that coal in the hole. Keep that oil in the soil. Keep that coal in the hole. Keep that coal in the hole. Keep that oil in the soil. Keep that coal in the hole. Keep that oil in the soil. Keep that coal in the hole. Keep that oil in the soil. Keep that coal in the hole. Keep that oil in the soil. Keep that coal in the hole. Woo! 
All right, well, speaking of keeping that oil in the soil, uh, our next speaker is Dan from the very successful Work University Endorsement Campaign that divested this past week. Yeah! Dan has been very instrumental in that campaign over the past two years, and he is a mathematician, and he just finished uni, and now he's going to tell us his life plan. No, he's going to tell us a little bit about university campaigns, so let's get it up for Dan. Hello everyone, sorry, I wrote some trains, it's a bit of uh, ramshackle. Um, and if I sound a bit hoarse, it's like a potent cocktail of like, overzealous chanting and, and alcohol. So, um, yeah. All right, so I'm Dan, yeah, I'm uh, just graduated from Warwick Uni, what I do on Tuesday. Um, my mum's making me go to ceremony as well, so it's been good. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce the university dimension by way of my own experience a little bit. Um, <coughs> I went to see Bill McKibben, uh, progenitor, of, or, you know, not quite actually, students of Swarthmore deserve, deserve credit, of course. Um, speak in Birmingham in October 2013 as part of a European-wide tour. Uh, there was a very cool band, a script that he knew at like, the back of his hand, um, and Naomi Klein on a big screen, and it was very well put together and very, very compelling and um, very affecting. I went because I'd recently discovered that climate change uh, is actually pretty bad. Uh, it turns out the severity of the climate crisis is, you know, the gravity of it is, uh, is quite shocking, and I wasn't really aware of that, so I went to school up and maybe do something about it. But what I wasn't, wasn't expecting was to be immediately swept up in the fastest-growing divestment movement in history. Um, so there's one guy at the university, uh, which is Warwick, which has been said, I guess, uh, who had meanwhile been working on Kickstarter our campaign and joining the 40 or so uh, other ones in the UK which were in play at the time. And that number's increased since. He actually turned out to be Caroline Lucas' son, so that was an interesting fact. Um, he took names on the night and set up a divestment dream team Facebook group, started collecting signatures, running photo campaigns, educating ourselves, organizing tabling sessions to alert other students to what we were doing and what we thought was necessary to take this money out of the fossil fuel industry. Um, Facebook was our political organizing tool of choice, and I want to take a moment to lament that fact, because it's quite prevalent in the movement, particularly in the student movement, um, uh, which I don't think is the right, do the right uh, platform for that. Um, all this kind of essential groundwork essentially constituted movement building, uh, and from a more cynical perspective, also served to legitimize in the public sphere uh, the demands we were making of our institution. So we got wide-based support, 1,500 signatures, etc., academics writing an open letter together, all this kind of stuff uh, puts a lot of pressure on the university. And it was only possible because People and Planet, which is the UK's largest student network campaigning on world poverty, human rights, and the environment, had recently undertaken to support the Fossil Free campaign in the UK. So that's why Fossil Free UK, in terms of the university campaign, started about two years ago. Because part of what makes PMP so special is that this decision was made democratically by students in the network. Um, it's a sincerely student-led organization. Uh, the support of paid organizers meant better resources, proper advice on the campaign, on tactics, etc and the ability, importantly, of the UK movement in, student, in the universities to go from strength to strength to strength. Fast forward two years, and the movement in UK academic institutions has blossomed. There are now 65 groups on campuses across the UK. That equates, on average, there's about 30 involved at each one, so that's about 20,000 student campaigners and a campaign with real power and momentum. Almost a year ago, Glasgow sounded the firing gun with a commitment to divest their £19 million in divest, sorry, investments, uh, in their endowment over five years, thanks to the dedication of Glasgow Climate Action, and since then, six other dominoes have fallen uh, in, in line with that. Uh, Bedfordshire, SOAS, Oxford, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Edinburgh, and on Wednesday, our meeting of the University of Warwick Council in the obscenely grandiose new campus that we have in the Shard, uh, which is bankrupted Warwick Business School, um, <laughs> uh, they decided to put their money where their mouth was and to commit to full divestment, which was a fantastic result for us. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, so despite our hard two for one minute, okay. despite our hard fought two year campaign, we were not hopeful. We were pretty unawares by this result. Um, and, you know, the university still maintains strong ties with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, my point is the fight isn't over. Divestment's only the beginning, but it's a very good place to start. Um, and uh, these successes are compounding to provide serious leverage for student campaigners on the ground who can argue that their university is getting left in the dust and encourage them to brandish their environmental credentials and situate themselves on the right side of history. Of course, we're not dealing with necessarily human beings governed by their conscience, but instead senior management, whose agenda is often necessarily antithetical to that of students forwarding moral, ethical, or human rights-based arguments. Theirs is the language of rate of return, ours of human suffering and climate justice. But when our universities insist on refusing to acknowledge the crushing weight of rational argument, and further pressure is required, students have proven themselves willing to put their bodies on the gears, to borrow from Mario Savio, 
And Edinburgh Uni were insisting on pursuing shareholder engagement, for example, but an epic 10-day occupation of an emotional building um, proved to be the tipping point. It turns out that disruptive direct action can be the most compelling argument in our arsenal. Um, so with the new academic year and a new influx of fresh planetary defenders, successes are going to pile up exponentially. The snowball is unstoppable. And as we are keen on saying, the students united will never be defeated, and we will defeat the voracious and rogue fossil fuel industry alongside all you beautiful people and everyone else around the world. Uh, thanks very much. Oh. Some, some pretty inspiring stuff, and it really goes to show um, people get together on days like today, they make a plan, they commit to it, uh, they put their bodies on the line, and they can have success. So really use that as a point of inspiration, I think, today. Um, the next speaker is Holly Templer, um, from humble origins in the catering industry. She first got involved in uh, climate activism after um, going on the Story of Stuff website. Um, she was involved in organizing the September 2014 uh, march in, in Bristol and has since been working with the Fossil Free campaign down in, down in Bristol. So I'd like to invite her um, to talk a bit about that. Hello. Uh, Fossil Free Bristol. <laughs> Got my homies up in the corner there. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about um, the local authority divestment campaigns that are happening all over the world. And you may have listened to that amazing talk by Dan and thought, well, I'm not a student, so I can't get involved with that. But everybody lives within the remit of a local authority, so you can all get involved with what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so... Um, the local government, so that's all the local councils, local city councils, local um, county councils, all borough councils that collectively in the UK have over £225 billion pounds of investments. £225 billion. So obviously not all of that is in fossil fuels, but a large chunk of it is because they, they always are. Um, unfortunately, we're not like uh, Norway. A couple of people have mentioned Norway, how they've managed to campaign to move their entire sovereign wealth fund in one go. Um, if we want to be as cool as the Scandinavians, and, and let's face it, we all do, um, <laughs> we all have to start our individual campaigns in our individual councils. So if you're not already involved in one, I think you should be, and I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> so following on from the success of the uni campaigns, as you've heard, loads of, of uh, campaigns have popped up all over the country from uh, Oxford, that was the first one that started last year, um, to Birmingham, to Edinburgh, Kirklees, Bristol, all over the place. And um, there's loads of them in London, actually. And i assuming that most of you are living in London. Maybe, should we have a show of hands? Yeah, quite a lot of you. <laughs> and you may have noticed the big banner at the back there, Diverse London, and you might be thinking, well, there's already a campaign in London, so I can switch off. But... There's loads of little borough councils all over London as well, and we need a campaign in each of those. I know there's already a campaign in uh, Camden, I think, and Hackney, and Greenwich. 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 Yeah, <laughs> but there's loads more, and I think you should all be starting your own ones in your own uh, individual borough councils. Um, so both Oxford and Bristol City Councils have made divestment commitments. Woo! <laughs> but they're the only ones so far so we really need some more people behind this um, it's, it's city councils they also have a lot of money in their local authority pension funds and that's what we've turned our attention to now is the Avon pension fund so by the way if there's anybody in here from uh, the Avon area that's Bath, North East Somerset Bristol, South Gloucestershire North Somerset Come and speak to us, because we want you in our campaign. Um, <laughs> just a little plug there. Um, it's, it's not easy, I'm going to be honest. It's, um, it's quite a slow, uh, boring <laughs> sort of campaigning. Um, but you get a lot of help and information from both 350, and there's a fantastic um, group called Share Action who um, help people divest their pension funds. And they've got great website and they're always on the phone like ready to help you if you need it um 
And we also have a network between all of our campaigns. We have an email group and we have regular Skype check-ins and we share information. And so now that we're already up and running, if you start a new one, you'll have loads of support. Um, so over the next year, we're hoping that more and more campaigns will pop up. Friends of the Earth have also committed to start encouraging their own local groups to form their own campaigns. Uh, so if you're already involved in a Friends of the Earth group, you should be doing that. Um, and if you're still thinking you're not sure if you can do this or why me, um, I'd like to tell you to think instead of why, why not me? Because who else is going to do it? <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, thank you. That was great. And speaking of Divest London, if you want to come to the Divest London session and learn how to plan a direct action in London with me, <laughs> whoo, yeah, okay, that'll be in a few hours. So um, I want to introduce now Siobhan Grimes. She's a fossil-free campaigner focusing on church divestment through the Operation Noah Bright Now campaign. All right. <laughs> So as Danny said, the goal of the divestment movement is to socially and politically bankrupt the fossil fuel industry. And faith groups, as well as lots of other civil society groups, have a big role to play in that. So I've been tasked with just giving you a bit of an overview on what's happening with church um, divestment campaigning. Of course, there's other faith campaigning as well. Um, and I would love to hear more about those. We're having a session at 1.45 with faith campaigners, so please come along and share with me your stories um, of faith campaigning, especially outside of the church, because I'm very interested in hearing those. So about the church, um, start with some good news. So the divestment movement started at Swarthmore College in America, which is a Quaker college, so it seems fitting that the Quakers in Britain were the first faith group to divest. And the United Reformed Church of Scotland have also divested from fossil fuels. I've got my fingers crossed for the United Reformed Church in the UK. Um, the last month, the Methodist Church Conference decided, um, chose to divest from tar sands and coal, and it was a very overwhelming level of support for divestment. And so it was really <laughs> I'm hoping, I think lots of people are hoping that over the next few years that divestment will go further into other fossil fuel um, industries. The Church of England, ever complicated. The, um, so the Diocese of Oxford and Birmingham, a diocese is a group of churches who come together to make kind of local decisions. And they both passed um, resolutions for fossil fuel divestment and Oxford Diocese has agreed to, like, to divest its own funds the debate, so when things are passed in, in, in a diocesan synod, they go up to general synod, which is like the mothership of synods, that's everybody, comes together and makes big decisions over a series of decades, <laughs> if we're honest. But, so, <laughs> so um, divestment is due to be, was due to be debated at general synod, which is happening this week, so it starts tomorrow. As far as I know, that debate has changed to be more about engagement. I'm not entirely sure how that's happened. Um, but there is an amendment that's being put forward next week, which is fine. Go ahead and... Um... Oh, wait. Very important thing I need to say first. The Church of England has decided to divest from tar sands and coal, which is brilliant. <laughs> so... <laughs> this... <laughs> I'm talking about other fossil fuels. There is an amendment that says go ahead and engage on other um, forms of fossil fuels, but if nothing changes in three years um, and there isn't, and the fossil fuel companies haven't reduced their exploration and extraction to align with the two degrees temperature rise, which as we all know or will know at the end of the day isn't going to happen, then, um, thank you, then divest. So I think that amendment would be as close to a bigger divestment as possible. So I'm really, really hoping that that goes through um, this week. And also there's Christian Climate Action who have been doing lots of more creative 
pop up campaign actions, including a divestment party outside St Paul's. All of the Christian climate action campaigns involve quite a lot of singing and dressing up. Um, <laughs> fitting with churches, if you go to one, you know we do dressing up and singing very well. Um, we've had a fossil free nativity play outside a Methodist. Uh, oh, the building name has gone out of my mind Methodist Central Hall at Christmas. And there was a banner drop during the last General Synod, which was in London last some time ago, I can't remember. But it was very good and it was very well received. Um, hopefully, oh, stop, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Javun. Um, the church knows, knows how to party. Uh, um, so just before the next speaker, I'm not going to ask you to sing again, but I am going to ask everyone to stand up quickly and just shake it out. Bit, get a bit of energy in. Just shake it out. Shake it out. OK, you can stop shaking now. Please sit down. Cool. Um, so, our final speaker before the Q&A, um, we're super lucky to have Wolfgang Blau, who is Director of Digital at The Guardian and a co-founder of the Climate Publishers Network, which aims to expand, uh, to create a global pool of content um, across loads of outlets um, to expand coverage of climate change in the run-up to the summit in Paris in December. So, Wolfgang Blau, thank you very much. Hey. Hi. So, how many minutes have I got? <laughs> Nine, okay. Nine, okay. All right, so thanks a lot for having me here. It's great. Um, I thought I, because I'm not an environmental uh, journalist, nor am I a divestment expert, um, as, as you already heard, I'm the, the Guardian's Director of Digital Strategy, and Alan Rusperger, our former Editor-in-Chief, who has just left the Guardian in this role, uh, asked me to join this team and to support it because, of course, um, as a journalist, I have a great interest, and as a citizen, and as a father um, in divestment. Um, how did it all begin at The Guardian? Alan Rusperger, after 20 years um, being the chief editor uh, at The Guardian, uh, and after an incredible run in these last three or four years with stories the size of WikiLeaks, or News of the World, or then the Snowden story, felt in his last weeks uh, that there's one big topic about which he hasn't done enough, and that is climate change. And that's remarkable if you look at the fact that The Guardian is one of the few large uh, newspaper websites that does have a big environment section, different from certain other competitors of ours who have basically shut them down for all kinds of uh, 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 commercial and other reasons. Um, so he gathered the group, and we thought, so what can we do? Of course, there's the summit this, this autumn. What do we do? Should we, should we even base it on that summit, given that that could be a very disappointing frame of reference and that we also need a, uh, a narrative that goes far beyond that next summit in Paris in the autumn. Um, and then there was the question, should we campaign? Should journalists campaign? Uh, or isn't the best thing we can do to just produce hard-hitting journalism and educate and inspire uh, uh, our societies? So that is, of course, a tension that's always there. Uh, we are certainly not the first in the UK to run a campaign. The Sunday Times, Conservative Sunday Times, did a fantastic campaign in the uh, early 70s about the compensation for the, the victims of the medication called uh, thalidomide. I think that's how you pronounce it, right? So, of course, there were models to look at of what works. Um, and then we eventually had this discussion, really, divestment. Some of us were afraid that that would inevitably strengthen that camp that wants to invest ever more heavily into nuclear power, which also is controversial, also within The Guardian. But that's, in the end, what we settled on. And, of course, we were in conversations with uh, Georges Monbiot, a Guardian columnist, uh, Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein, and many others. Um, and then the, the, the most immediate challenges we run into as journalists is, of course, communicating climate change. We knew we don't want to engage in proving climate change or questioning the science. That's not what we do. I think that's a given by now. Um, but how do you explain divestment? And then how do you explain that fact that I've just touched upon, that we, the Guardian, run a campaign? Then how do you explain our choice of the targets, which were the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation? And then how do you explain who is the Wellcome Trust and who is the Gates Foundation? And you can't forget our readers. Two-thirds of our 40 million readers a month are from outside the UK. Um, and then um, how do we explain that our own 
company, the Guardian Media Group, which is owned by the Scott Trust, that foundation that uh, 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 enables the Guardian, is also invested in, in fossil energy. So we, we immediately from the start and before the start knew there was a credibility issue and we had to deal with it. And, and uh, there was, it was not a given that the Guardian Media Group under the leadership of Neil Burkett uh, would actually make that decision that the Guardian Media Group would divest. But given that that is a, uh, uh, an asset holder of right around 800 million pounds, that was a big first move that we could deliver right from our own building. Um, and then things just took off. And, and that's always that element where we, we didn't quite know, if, is it credible if we do that? Will the world respond? Um, but within only a few weeks, um, uh, key players within the United Nations and the summit staff, uh, members of government, uh, former American presidents uh, reached out to us and said, this is fantastic, keep going. And of course, we also are in touch with journalists in many newsrooms around the world, also much more conservative newsrooms, that say this really helps us internally, that you, the guardian, uh, that you are doing this. But how do you measure impact? You know, especially in digital journalism, we're, we're pretty good by now at measuring what happens on our sites, how many seconds you stay with us, what you read after that text, what you watch before that video, how long you scroll down, even on different devices. But the, the, the now what, what happens in your heart, what happens in your brain, what happens in your spirit after you walk away from interacting with us? That is, of course, something we, we can only guess and then we see certain things, such as that the Financial Times, how many minutes do I have? Got you. Um, the Financial Times uh, initially greeted our, our campaign with a very broad editorial saying that divestment in general doesn't work, and even its merits in South Africa, I think they also questioned. Um, and just look how the Financial Times has changed in the last three months. It is remarkable how they are, I think, endorse uh, 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 divestment from fossil fuels. Lessons learned, um, and of course, that's my hope that maybe there is something in it for you as well with, with your much greater expertise in, in, in divestment is we learned, of course, we are still and always will be much better at journalism than at campaigning. Uh, case in point, we want to produce stories. We look for good stories, and we knew we had to focus on our stories. But a typical issue, of course, is a week or two or three weeks in, there are hundreds of stories. And I, once in between, I looked at 350.org, and I thought, yeah, they, they do it right. They have an explainer text, and what is this about text, and here's the petition. The Guardian at that point already was throwing hundreds of stories at you. Uh, so that, 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 that need for simplicity and a simple entry point is something that we certainly wrestled with because in the end we are, we are journalists and we want to produce new material every day. What we also learned is embrace your target, the target being the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. We never wanted to alienate them. We always made clear from the beginning we admire what you do. You're doing such good work around the world. We are in, in close conversation with Bill Gates. He has just been visiting us, I think, a little more than half a year ago to speak about our global development journalism around the world that he's partially sponsoring. So this was not about making personal enemies. It made it even more complicated for us, and we were wondering, will they pull out? Um, but we had to take that risk. It is about come clean and give them a way out. I think it's really important to give your target a way out and to not corner them, because that's when they get dangerous. And also, what do we want to achieve in the end? We want to achieve uh, not total victory, but change. Um, Collaborate, collaborate with the other groups, networks, actors, uh, and put your ego aside in two ways. Um, if you think about it, most of the things we enjoy today, our freedom to assemble, our uh, freedom of speech, our right to vote, I think all of these things we owe to people who were fighting for them knowing very well they would not see them become reality during their lifetimes. They didn't do it to be the founders of or the initiators of, or to, to get the XYZ award. Awards are fine, and of course we all are human and have egos. But I think sometimes it's also that gets in the way, in the way of us uh, collaborating. And that uh, can also mean in this Climate Publishers Network that, that happened almost accidentally, um, that we also work with, with, with newspapers and with publications now that are really at the other end of the political spectrum. Because we say climate change in the end, for this to work, and for us to, to survive this challenge uh, and, and re-engineer our societies and economies, we have to make sure that this is not a left-wing or a right-wing issue. It's all of us. 
And so in this publisher's network, there are conservative papers like Germany's Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. There are direct competitors, fierce competitors of The Guardian, like the Sydney Morning Herald. Since about three years, there's Guardian Australia, big investment for us, one more minute. Uh, and also the Chinese, the largest uh, uh, English-speaking newspaper of China, said, can we join? And we said, really? Um, is, you know, is that journalism? That's government PR, really? But then we looked at what, you know, speaking of the, the, the dome curve earlier on, China made a big contribution to solar being more affordable. China has a really important story to tell, and how can you be credible with a global project without having Chinese journalists uh, have a voice in that. So that is what I mean with putting your ego aside. And then lastly, um, and I think it was Rikin Patel of um, Move On, who we invited for a brainstorming session, and he said, what's really important, and I'm sure that applies to your work as well, is just when you think no one can stand it to hear you say your thing one more time, that's just the point when people are just about getting ready to listen. So good luck and thank you for your hard work.